Okay, so uh, we're going to post this one uh, after the class. And as I said before, it's a good idea to turn off the microphone. And if you hear the sound starts to lag, I know the last time it was an issue. And uh, please let me know either through the chat or something like that, that there is an issue with the sound. It was not apparently the, uh, the, the microphone, it was the internet for some reason that slowed down. I don't know if it's my end, honestly, or if it's the uh, internet service provider or it's from Zoom or something. But the problem was not from the microphone. I just wanted to touch base with that. Other than that, we have, uh, let me go to uh, the uh, canvas right now quickly. We have a project that is due on the 9th. If you started working on it, that's fine. If you want to submit what you, uh, what you worked on, that's fine. Let me uh, share that window with you guys to give you an idea of what I'm looking at in here. We have this project in here, the retrograde motion of Mars. I know at least even when we were in session, some of you have already started on this project. Those who did not really need to start as soon as possible because it's due on the 9th, which is not uh, this Thursday, but the Thursday after. Next week, basically, is when it's due, okay? So I need you guys to finish that. I know some of you had questions, and uh, I don't know if, uh, so this is basically the project. This file in here where it says the response form for the retrograde Mar Mars motion, uh, retrograde Mar motion of Mars, this will be changed, okay? So if you did not submit, this project, please do not. Okay, give me at least until the end of today. Tonight I have a class actually that ends at 10 p.m. So I'll try to do it before the end, the end of the night. If not, by tomorrow morning, I'm going to change this file right now. This file is a, uh, is a static file, basically. You're supposed to print it, fill it by hand, and then bring it to the classroom. Since we are not doing anything in the classroom, I'm changing this file to become a PDF fillable file. Basically, you fill it uh, like a Word file, basically, like a Word document. Uh, you fill it electronically, and then once it's filled, you're going to submit it back onto Canvas, because right now the whole thing has to be uploaded. We're not supposed to be meeting. I mean, we want to minimize as much contact as possible, and then this is a requirement not just for us. The entire world is going through this thing. So I want you guys to uh, do not submit your file if you're going to do it tonight. Wait until at least tomorrow night or the day after. At least you see the new version of this file. Once you see it, then you can, you can upload it. I want to go briefly on this product. I know we have a new chapter to start, and I know we have an exam next week. But I just want to, uh, to talk about this one in here. Uh, there is an issue. I don't know if you guys have seen the changes I made for Canvas, but I did make changes on the syllabus. Uh, the, the change that the biggest change that was made was the fact that uh, at least there is a question mark that the school did not decide 100% on and whether or not we will have a spring break and it's time or not. It took, uh, a week off, so now the school is actually, they met last week, and I don't know if they reached a decision or not on it. They want to probably continue instruction all the way through, including uh, the, the spring break we're supposed to break. So there is a potential that uh, class is not canceled there, okay? So that's uh, something that I want you guys to be aware of. Also, today, was today supposed to be no class? Anybody know in the old syllabus? I think it was. I think it was the whole form here, so I want you to pay attention to the changes that were made in the uh, syllabus. So when you go back into uh, the syllabus, it's in here. This information is outdated. It needs to be revised. And I believe uh, the 31st, when are we, the 31st in here? 330. Yeah, no, 330. Uh, the right yeah. yeah, the it's what's supposed to be have no class today. 
but we changed that under the new under the new in the new syllabus to uh, to have this because remember we canceled the class a long time ago and I think that's pushing us in terms of the exam so it's really going to be a problem so we really have to work around that we may do the exam after the spring break if the spring break happens on the uh, on the way that it was initially scheduled so if I go back into the uh, announcements the last syllabus I sent you guys. I hope you guys had the uh, chance to look at it. Every time you see a color thing, that's where the changes are happening. I'm going to open the file in here. And if I open it, it's going to take, you're not going to be able to see it. So I'm going to stop the sharing of that file. I'm going to come back in here and share that one instead, which is here. So this is the new syllabus. So instead of meeting on, in uh, PL123, of course, we're meeting now online. And the instruction is happening mainly on Canvas. Everything that you see in here in blue is, are the changes. So each chapter will be in its own discussion section, like you have already seen, if you didn't see that. Uh, lecture will be conducted via Confer Zoom, which is where we are right now. Every uh, lecture will be a recorded lecture like this one will be posted back on uh, its discussion session. So right now we're still doing chapter, we started actually, we're starting chapter six, so we're gonna put this on chapter six. PowerPoint fly, uh, slides, when applicable, and they are in this case, they're going to be uploaded, but I'm going to upload them in PDF format. So uh, it's, it's, they are transferable because when you have a file that is in PDF, that is a portable doc, a document file, it can work on any platform. But if you send it to somebody in, uh, in PowerPoint, some people don't have it and they cannot open it. And if they do have it, it may change the format and it may not be readable. So that's why I use PDF all the time. And that's why I actually like PDF because PDF can serve as format. Anyway, that's one thing in here. All assignments are going to be submitted online. There is no paper submittal. So if you don't have access to a, an imaging device, you're gonna have a problem. That's why I'm changing that club, the product, uh, anything from now on, if we're going to be required to, uh, to be submitted to me, to be in a, in a PDF format, if possible. If not, I take anything else in text format, uh, an image, that's what JPG stands for in here, any image will do, okay? If you can uh, have access to a uh, PDF maker, there is a PDF maker actually on your computers. What is the uh, chat session in here? Okay, there is something called Qt PDF. PDF is a free software that you can download on your computer and print directly from it. So when you go and print, one of the options after you download it and install it successfully on your computer, you're going to have this one in here called the Qt PDF. I put this one on the chat room. And also, there is another thing also called uh, PDF Creator, I think. But uh, anyway, when you download this one, you have to be very careful because you have to download it from something reputable. And something that I trust all the time is this website, uh, CNET. So if you're gonna download or try to download it from CNET, don't download it from anywhere. You might end up with something that you don't want. If you have any time version 10 or more of Windows, if you have a computer with Windows 10 or newer, you're going to have Microsoft has something and it's now called the print to PDF as a printer option on your computer. So if you have that, that's gonna convert any file that you have in there into something called print to PDF. So again, you can convert any document that you want to, to PDF. If you don't have that, there is apparently a website out there. You can upload stuff to it and it's gonna give you stuff on PDF. PDF is good, like I said, it can serve as your format. There is no S or best about it. That's how it looks, that's how it's going to come out. Now, if you can do PDF, don't worry about it. Send it in whatever format that you guys have. I take Word, I take Excel, I take uh, uh, any word processor that you can think of, I can, I can handle, there is no problem with it. Uh, text, image, if you want to take a picture with your phone and send it, that's fine too. As long as, and this is key, you can read it. If you can't read it, I can't either. So that's the rule of thumb. If you cannot read what you uh, basically take a picture and it looks tilted and you try, oh, this doesn't look like what I meant, then please do it again so that I can read it for you. Otherwise, I will not be able to, to do it, okay? 
So everything is going to be conducted online. I just want to touch base on this one to make sure that we have, a, that we have that understanding because this is now the new official uh, uh, the new official discussion uh, the, the new official syllabus uh, basically anything that contradicts this this syllabus in terms of format will be either modified or ignored okay so chapter 6 let me go back to the beginning of this chapter i want to minimize this oh man when i'm in time so that's really what happened here I was having problems today with the, this thing completely. So let me stop the sharing of that screen in here. Stop share. And let me go back to the PowerPoint. Again, the PowerPoint, I have them, but as you guys know, noticed from the previous one, this thing starts to grow after a while. So you, because uh, you keep on adding slides and content to it. So if I upload it now, and then upload it later, you might think that if I upload it now that you have all of the entire version of it. So what I was thinking to do is actually uh, refrain from uploading, uploading it until we're completely done with the lecture. Then I upload the finalized version of the, of the PowerPoint, that way you'll have a final recording of it. So you're looking at this screen, so we're gonna start this chapter in here. So this is chapter six. And chapter six deals basically with the astronomical instruments, namely telescopes, okay? Because uh, we look at instruments in the universe, we look at objects in the universe outside of Earth, and at this point, we mastered the technology of uh, telescopes. And the telescope basically collects the light, uh, it tries to discern light from uh, one way to the other, different frequencies basically and gives us an image of the object, tells us basically its structure by analyzing the light that's received from there, and persists the data. So there are three basic functions what the telescope does. Collect light, filter it, and then persist or analyze to help us analyze the data. So that's basically the three things that we do with the telescope. There are different kinds of telescopes depending on the, 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 uh, the frequencies that are used. There are the visible, range light that that's are within our own eyesight and there are the, those that are in the infrared region and there are those that are in the ultraviolet region basically and depending on the device there is different technology that is involved for it one of the uh, common themes that i have personally noticed uh, is that uh, i'm sorry somebody sent me a message actually from another class anyway one of the common themes that I have personally noticed when teaching astronomy is some of the students are really interested to go and buy their own telescopes after the classroom, after they take astronomy class, because they want to acquire, to get their hands onto a device so that they can use it. Uh, the advice that they usually give is, it's like basically going into the showroom and trying to buy a car. Usually you never, up into the first car and tell them this is this. Usually try to look, see around, see which one you like, which one you don't like. And this is more of a personal choice. So try them first before you buy them, okay? But part of the purpose of this uh, uh, chapter is actually to give you an idea how a telescope works so that actually when you go, you have a rough idea how what, what you want in a telescope, okay? So we're gonna talk about that technology Again, we're going to start with the easy ones first, and then we'll build our our uh, our uh, our chapters in here. Again, for those who are not here, let me check in here quickly in here to make sure that I have a. I need to do a stop sharing this thing. I'm going to take a quick uh, uh, screen, basically view in here. Where is my? So that they have everybody who's here at least in terms of attendance to get full credit for the attendance. Okay. Uh, let me go back into the sharing the PowerPoint. So basically, this is uh, uh, 
what is it, the Hubble telescope, which is one of the legacy devices that went a long time ago, and it's still useful. We are collecting a lot of information using it. It gives us uh, outstanding pictures, basically outstanding images of the, uh, of the sky, still also in the visible region, in the light that we normally see. That's its technology. It uses that, and uh, it was supposed to live only for a certain amount of time and for a long time, more than what it was originally planned for. Okay, uh, these are some of the images that we get. I know we guys looked at this constellation last time. This is Orion. This is here, it's what, safe. This is the belt. This is Rigel. This is Bellatrix, and this is a uh, Betelgeuse. So these are the stars of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Orion. Now, this part of Orion, I don't know if we had a chance to talk about it last time or not, with the, with the, with the, uh, when we did the uh, Stellarium, which is the modified version of the planetarium, basically doing it in class. This, when you uh, uh, zoom on it, you will find all kinds of uh, stellar formations in there. You will find all kinds of activities there. Actually, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a nebula in here. Oops. They take me outside of that. Okay. So again, uh, that's the power of telescopes. This is what you see with the naked eye. And then as you can change the image, you're going to have, uh, as you can zoom in, you're going to have more details on different regions of the, of the sky. And also as you change the frequency, you're going to have different, different uh, uh, amounts of energy. For example, in an X-ray, you will know that uh, more uh, hotter objects they will be emitting higher frequencies meaning that uh, shorter wavelength, then you will see that, hey, that object is much hotter than what it appears. If we look at it with the visible telescope or with our own eyes, it looks dark to us. We can't even see anything. But those objects are for, far more uh, energetic. They emit more energy, and they have higher temperature, actually, because of the fact that they, uh, they emit in a higher frequency that we can see at all. That we cannot see with our own eyes or even with telescopes that are in the visible region. That's why we have to have technology that can see in different frequencies. In the infrared, again, those are uh, either light that has shifted, coming at higher frequency, and then shifted toward low frequency, or uh, basically objects that are much cooler in temperature. So this thing, again, once you have that wide range of, uh, of devices that can collect light for you, you can learn more about what you're looking at. Okay. So looking by just with the, with the naked eye, you're not going to get a lot of information, okay? Well, our ancestors used all kinds of devices in the old days to basically rely just on the visible, on the eye, and, uh, and collect information. So they used different, uh, uh, basically, uh, monuments to look at the uh, objects in different times of the, uh, of the year and collect that information. And once they collected it, they tried to analyze it. Some of them documented it actually on rocks, and later on we started documenting documenting compare. So the series too, except they were limited with the tools they had. Uh, I want to say something in here before I forget, because right now we are actually on the verge of a brand new technology that doesn't use electromagnetic uh, radiation, and that is gravity waves. I don't know if you heard of the um, LIGO telescope. Did we talk? About, I don't think we did. I don't think we ever talked about it in this classroom. So basically, those are some of the newer technologies that doesn't use light at all. It uses uh, gravity waves. So basically, what you have in here, you have a uh, supermassive object that this, any mass actually, doesn't matter how big the object is, will, uh, will create a, will, 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 uh, is of course, according to modern physics, according to uh, uh, relativity, uh, the form space time continuum, they form the entire fabric where everything sits on. And as it moves, it's going to create waves in, the, in that environment. Of course, the more massive object, the more intense that radiation is. So right now, the only objects we can study with that technology are basically uh, black holes or uh, neutron stars. Those are the supermassive objects or concentrated enough objects when they, when they interact they do so in such a way they create disturbances, and we were able to collect them, and we collect them all the time. I have here an application on my phone, which is a free application actually, called the GW application, GW event. 
this activity waves this. I don't know if you see it or not. There is a reflection from uh, the mirror in here. So, oh. So this one is, gives you all kinds of things that are happening. Collisions that happen in the in the in the uh, in the uh, between the binary between I'm sorry uh, neutron stars and actually black holes. I think they still start collecting data because part of this project involves hundreds of people working on this thing, and they stopped working because of the fact of this uh, pandemic that is spreading around. So they too were affected by this one. So they are not collecting data anymore. They are not actually analyzing because this machine has thousands and thousands of instruments and they need tweaking and adjustments and things like that and they need a lot of people working on them and that is true also for electromagnetic radiation the, this telescope that we're talking about there are quite a lot of people and they too apparently are affected by what's going on so people are now basically staying away from uh, from this thing a telescope relies on let me check i'm checking in here to see if i have a lens apparently i don't i usually have a lens lying around in here next my, my desk. So I don't have lenses, but probably you have seen what lenses are. I mean, most people do, at least this is part of the toys that you play with. This is, this is, this is actually my, one of my reading glasses, and it has lenses in it too. Every lens has what is called a focal point, okay? Let me go and stop the sharing of the screen because I want to get to have a, an understanding of how the optics of these devices work. I'm going to stop it right now. And I go into this screen in here. Let me go into back into the sharing in here to share the other screen. If you guys have any question, please do not hesitate to ask it either in the chat room, like I said before, or uh, directly. Okay. So any optical device, they rely basically on two uh, laws. Okay, those are the laws of the, of the, of the reflection and refraction. Okay, so uh, let me get into these two laws first of all. Those are called Snell's laws. S N E L laws. That's his name. Okay, he worked on this one. Actually, a lot of people worked on this one. If you, uh, this is one of the things, one of the few document things that uh, Greek have done experiments with. Greeks are uh, known to have uh, worked on philosophy and mathematics and did everything basically on paper, except, and they did not do a lot of uh, hands-on experiments. This is one of the things that few things that they have worked on. So if you have a flat surface in here, like a mirror, a reflecting mirror, and if you have a beam of light coming at it at an angle in here, of course, you know, it's going to bounce back. So this is called the incidence this is the reflected. This law says that the angle of incidence, which is this angle, must be equal to that angle. So when you look at an object on the mirror, on a flat mirror, basically what's going on is, as you look at your toes from the mirror, the light that leaves your, the, your toes goes into the mirror and reflects back and comes to your eyes in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. If you keep on looking from toes all the way to your head, you're going to see a reflected image of yourself on the other side of the mirror. I, I hope you guys know that there is no other person on the other side of the mirror by now. Do you? <laughs> it's just a reflected image, okay? It follows this law, okay? So this is one of the basic laws, and we use that. Remember this word, reflected. There's another kind of uh, law that is actually uh, has to do how light comes in when it's had some two mediums, basically a medium. I want to get into the other side. Okay. So what happened in here is, so I have a medium in here, like for example, a, a thick glass or even, let's just forget about this one. Let's take this one and this is water, okay? As light comes in in here from the angle of incidence, so this is the incident beam, it's not gonna be reflected. It can be reflected actually, and there are conditions for it for reflections, but uh, it's going to be refracted in the sense it's not going to go straight out, but it's going to go at an angle. This angle in here is still the angle of incidence, and this angle in here is the angle of refraction. So this kind is a light that is not reflected, but rather is refracted. 
here is the one that is refracted, okay? So this is water, thick water, and this is air. And this is, there is another law that is related basically that says that the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, refraction the ratio of the sine, remember from your tech classes, if you take, ever check the check, is equal to the ratio of how fast light travels in air versus how fast tra light travels in, in, a, in water. Of course, light travels with the speed of light anywhere, but in between collisions between the atoms. So when it goes into, into water, there is a lot of molecules of water in there. So the, uh, uh, the light hits, molecule is absorbed, then released. During that time of the absorption, light is not going anywhere. That's why it slowed down. That's why light appears to be moving slower in the, in, the, in the water than in the air. In the air, we take it to be 300,000 kilometers per second, and the water turns out to be about 200,000 kilometers. So it's about 100,000 kilometers slower. So it's quite a bit. And uh, that's the reason why the light is refracted. It doesn't go straight through, okay? Based on that, that's basically the two operation versions of the telescope. They, there are two kinds, basically, of telescopes. Reflected uh, telescopes and uh, refractive telescopes, okay? We will see the difference between them, and we will know that basically uh, some work better than the other. Actually, some are much easier to make them into a compact format and, uh, and, and, uh, and have them portable. And those are the ones you're going to buy. You're not going to buy a, 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 a refractive, I'm sorry, a refractive telescope. You're going to buy a reflective telescope because you're not going to be able to carry with you 10 meter telescope. That's too much for your uh, your uh, your operation. So those are the two kinds of telescope, and they rely on the two laws of smell. And those are the two laws that we deal with them day in day out. Those are the things that work. If, you, if somebody gives you an access to your eye, or if you did an operation of your eye, you will find that it's made up of a lens. So this is the lens in the front of the eye. This is the entire eye, basically, of how it works. On the back of the eye, there is something called the retina. That's where all of the sensitive hair-like structure that is connected to the, to the nerve, to your uh, uh, what is it, optical nerve. <coughs> So basically, you're looking at an object in here, tree or bird, doesn't matter what that is, you're looking at the scene right now. Uh, the image, you're forming an image as the bottom comes in and it's going to be refracted. It's going to be, because this part of the lens, which looks actually like a lens, like the normal lens that we used to play with. So this is what the lens look like. If you put an object in it in here, in front of it in here, part of it is going to be going this way and this part in here again of the, every part, I'm talking about every single point, this point in here would come in here, it's going to be reflected and it's going to form basically an image at some point in here of the bottom. Same thing in here, the top is going to come in here and form straight out in the, in the point of symmetry, but also if you look at it from the bottom, it's going to come in here and form this one. So the image is going to be flipped. So if, you, if somebody can look at your inside of your, of your uh, retina, uh, what you're looking at, the entire room is backwards in your image. Somehow, this image is, it comes in here and forms into your, your, uh, your retina backwards, flip, and that is taken to the brain through the optical nerve, and the brain corrects it and, and, and makes it up, I mean, straight up. That's why you don't stumble into things when you walk, okay? There is a door, you open it, you go through it. It's not like by, up, <laughs> upside down, or there is a table, or there is a bed which is up and the ceiling is down. That's how the image actually is forming on your retina. It's forming upside down. Okay? <laughs> you guys are familiar with this idea, don't, don't you? I mean, the fact that cameras actually, they flip the image, but somehow when we make them, we flip them back and the image now looks straight up to our eyes. There was an experiment that was conducted a long time ago what they did, they gave this uh, healthy people, they don't have problems with their eyes, they gave them corrective lenses in here, and those corrective lenses all basically, the whole purpose of them was to flip the image. They gave them glasses so that the image is flipped in their eyes. 
So now when the image leaves from here and comes into the retina, it's flipped. So it's going to flip it up. So for a moment, these people were dizzy because the entire room looked upside down to their eyes. But apparently, the brain adjusted quickly. The brain corrected itself and gave them the image back up. And they were working fine. When they removed those lenses after the experiment, they removed them. Again, for a moment, their eyes were, uh, were, 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 uh, were, they were confused, basically. They didn't know where they were. Until a moment later on, the eye uh, uh, adjusted itself. The eye is a fascinating device, actually, and there's a lot of research in there. And if you go to any eye doctor, they put this solution in your eye, and they tell you, <laughs> Uh, blink a little bit and the things start to come fuzzy and everything and they study your eye and they look at it and it's, it's an amazing thing but the basic functions of the eye is just like a normal color a normal uh, lens so this is a lens and when when light comes in for a lens this is a this is there are different types of lenses there's convex and concave lenses but this is a convex lens this is how the eye works this is most of the time what we use for our uh, telescopes, we sometimes use concave lenses to move the image in a different location. So different lenses are used for different specific applications. We use lenses, we also use mirrors because some of this, uh, actually the, the cheaper portable uh, devices, they use mirrors. And mirror is usually made of a, uh, of a surface that is completely reflective. I mean, uh, that is completely, uh, uh, how should I say? Uh, darkened, okay? So there is only one area of the mirror. This is a concave mirror. This is a mirror that, there are, as opposed to the mirror that you look at in your car, which is like this, where the, uh, where the reflection is actually happening on this side, that's a convex mirror. And convex mirrors, they're not, actually you can use them. All of these devices, you can use them, okay? In, in, in modern day uh, telescopes. So those are the different devices that you have in there. Telescopes that use this technology is much easier to, uh, to work with than this technology in here. Because on this one, you have to worry about the surface itself. It has to be smooth on both sides. It has to be perfect on both sides. The radius has to be perfect on both sides. There is all kinds of technology involved for making lenses. They are more expensive. Hence, refractive ref uh, telescopes are more expensive, bulkier, and not good. These ones are easy to make, and they are smaller, and they are the ones that you're 99% of the time you're going to buy because you're not going to waste a lot of money on something that is not as good, okay? And easier to maintain anyway. So I hope that was an intro into optics a little bit so that you guys can have an understanding of how this thing works. So I'm going to go back in here to my PowerPoint, okay? Okay, I guess it's working here. So let's stop from there. So that's basically an idea of how this things work. Okay, at least the rough draft, if you wish, of how optics work. Anyone uh, intends to, or at least worked with an eye doctor or those people who make glasses, no? Yeah, I'm nearsighted as hell. <laughs> okay, uh, corrective lenses, which is a very important concept. I myself have that problem. Uh, the, the near point for everybody, that depends on age. You know how object is, if you take an object like this, for example, pen, and bring it to your, to your eye. I, if I remove the glasses, I really have to do the corrective, uh, the, see when is my comfortable zone? If I bring the object near my eye, at some point it's fuzzy, it becomes unreadable. So the near point, as you are young, for small children, for babies, basically, is only a few centimeters, about 10 centimeters or so. Adults, usually, on average, the number that people operate with is 25 centimeters. So an object that is this far, basically, that is an average person. Those people, normally, they don't need corrective lenses or at least uh, lenses for uh, for reading stuff. As you get older, usually the near point moves further away, okay? That's why 
when you're trying to read a book, for example, you need reading glasses because you want to bring the image that is further away, closer to your eye. So the reading in here, they bring the objects closer to your near and your point so that you can read it comfortably. And as you get older and older, you need more and more magnifications on this to, because your point is getting further and further away. And so you need to bring this thing and you probably need more, uh, more correctiveness. And then there are deformations with the eye. There are some eyes that are short eyes compared to, and the image does not really uh, uh, form on the retina itself. Let me go back into the, uh, it's, it's really a fascinating topic in here. Are you looking, which, what are you looking at right now? Are you looking at the PowerPoint or the, uh, okay. Let me go into back into this uh, thing in here. So there, the eye itself is, like I said, is a fascinating object and people study it all the time. One of the, uh, uh, the problems that, uh, that is a common problem is the, the, the lens in here is normal, but the image is forming far away. So you need to bring the, lens, the image to the retina again so that the nerve, of course, the image is not focused at this point. So you would want the image to be forming sharp on the retina itself, not so this point in here. So you need actually a, uh, what is it? A conver uh, uh, is it a converging lens? Yeah, I think a converging lens will do. Will bring the image to the point in here. The magnitude of this one, what is the focal point in here, uh, depends, and again, how, 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 what your eye is, how far is it from what it's supposed to be. And that's why the doctor usually may give you different lenses to give you and tell you, is it better, is it not, is it better, is it not, until he comes up with the correct uh, uh, focal point for your uh, eye. Now, there are people who have a, the, the problem backward. They have an eye where that is basically, uh, the image is forming in here. This is where the sharpness of the image is. We want it to be here. So what they do in here, they have a diverging lenses to push the image to where it's supposed to be, to the retina. And again, they give you the same process, adjusting back and forth to find the proper focal point. So what is the focal point? I know it's part of the slide. What is the focal point? Every lens, whether a convex or concave, has a focal point, except one of them is positive and one of them is negative. So if I take an object at infinity far away, star, for example, star is at infinity. So it emits light, all the rays that come from the star come in the same, they come parallel because it's far away. And when things emerge from far away, they are, they are more or less in the same direction. Actually, they are in the same direction. So all of this light, when it comes in, they will all focus into the same point. This distance is what we call the focal point. This is a property of the lens itself. Some lens, they are curved more than others, and that's where that distance is, uh, is, is relevant. That's what the distance becomes different, okay? So that's uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, focal point. Now, for, a, for, a, for an object like this one, and now if I, if I don't take an object at infinity, but rather close from it, in here, for example, the image is going to form in here, and it's what we call a real image, okay? Now, if I bring the object closer than the focal point, actually the image is not going to form on this side, it's going to form on this side, and it's not going to be a real image, it's going to be what is called the virtual image. In other words, if I take a plate in here, uh, a film, the image will burn on the film, and it's going to form an image there. But if I bring in here an image, a film, it's not going to form in there at all, because there is no actually light. The light is going this way. So the light that you have in there is actually where the source is. If I block the light out there, I will not be able to, to see the object in here. So that's why this is the virtual and this is real. So in other words, this topic is very, very rich. It's a very, very rich topic. And uh, being a person, I mean, if you know somebody who works on, uh, with, uh, with lenses and with glasses, reading glasses, or even prescription glasses, you will know it's a very, very complicated topic and it's a very rich topic and people can do careers in that. And actually it's one of the most challenging things and it's a fun thing too. Again, anyway, uh, again, this is uh, some of the things, there is no shame in having corrective lenses. This is something that the, the human eye is part of the, the device. What it's shame for is trying to look 
uh, somebody who is not, okay? So let me go back into the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint in here where we were. Okay, so again, this is the focal length. The focal length, length is where all the rays from infinity goes and meet, basically. Or, in the case of convex, concave uh, lens, is where they would have as if they came from. Okay, convex lens is, has a, a virtual uh, focal point, not a real focal point. Okay, so those are some of the terminology that is used in optics. Okay, again, these are the two types of, uh, of, uh, of telescopes that they uh, talked about. There is the refractor, the longer ones, and then there is the uh, reflector telescope, okay? The biggest difference between them is the fact that one of them uses a lens and one of them uses a mirror. So with the lens, basically, as the light comes in from, uh, from the star, or from a faraway object like Mars, for example, um, uh, Mars, or even Jupiter, planet like that reflects light of the sun. Now it comes in and here it's focused, this is the focal length. So this is DF. Every telescope that you go and buy has a focal length. Okay, so that's one of the basic properties. Now this distance from here to here is a focal distance. Now, from after that is basically where the light is going to come into uh, uh, the eye. So the person needs to be on this side of the lens looking at the faraway object, okay? The magnification actually relates, is related to how big this diameter, this is called the eyepiece, by the way. The eyepiece lens versus this lens in here versus the focal point, the focal distance. That's really what makes this more magnification. Magnification is not necessarily equate to a better telescope. Of course, the better the, or if everything is the same, higher magnification is better. But that's not the only parameter. So if the object was tiny, the object can be, uh, can, can, uh, can, uh, can be blown away from the uh, magnification. Which brings me back to the near point that we talked about earlier. If we didn't have a near point, if we can see anything to any distance whatsoever, then we can look at any objects in the universe and we can see it. For example, I can, if I have, what is that? Uh, corona COVID-19, the virus, we cannot see it with our own eyes. But if in case we could see any object at any distance, I can bring it all the way closer to my eye and I should be able to see it. Of course, I cannot do that now, especially with this virus being as nasty as it is. <laughs> So the point being in here is we have a limitation in what we can see. And that's why there is that near point. And you would want the object to be as comfortable to your eye as possible so that you can look at it. So when you're looking at Mars, for example, or looking at Jupiter, or looking at any object that you can look at with the, with the telescope, you would want to have a comfortable uh, sight of that object. So again, this is a, reflect, a refractor uh, telescope. This is most likely is not what you're going to buy because of, it's not, it's really, there are the small versions of them that you can find them in Walmart actually, and they're like for a few dollars, I don't know, $20, $40 or something like that. And they are not going to achieve a lot of the magnification, a lot of the basic, you cannot do a lot with them. And then there is a refractor, a reflector. This one uses a mirror and it's easier to maintain because you have to worry only about one surface in here. The starlight as it comes in, is reflected back into a point in here, which is very close from the focal point. So this distance from here to here is almost the focal distance, the focal, uh, uh, the focus of this uh, telescope. However, the focal point is slightly beyond because you want everything to be in a single point. So you'd want to make it in a finite uh, mirror so this mirror in here, the purpose of it is to direct the light now back to your eye. And this uses normal lens. Now, uh, when you go and buy a telescope, do not worry about this piece, the eyepiece, because the eyepiece usually is a replaceable piece, something that you can go. If you don't like it, you can get another piece and so on and so forth. But the problem with the eyepiece, if you want to make it with higher, higher magnifications, we would want to make this ratio as big as possible. 
The problem with it is an object even as big as the moon, when you look at it with the, with the more refined eyepiece, you'll find it move in the sky. And it's very hard to, to keep track of. Uh, uh, amateur tel 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 uh, telescope is not really something that is uh, easy to do. You have to really have be dedicated in it, practice it a lot. And once you do, you will develop techniques to track objects in the sky and be able to see them. So there, it's not something that is uh, from the get-go. You go and buy a telescope, you open it, and then you put it in here. Now I can uh, see uh, Venus or uh, uh, Jupiter or whatever uh, planet I'm interested in. Again, this is really what makes it uh, a uh, for a telescope. This is the one that you're interested in. What you are actually far more important for you in here than the magnification is this area, is this radius, is this uh, diameter. The bigger it is, the moral of the story, the better it is, basically. That's what that thing is. And the bigger it is, the more expensive it is. And the bigger it is, the more uh, requires the uh, maintenance, basically. You have to make sure that these two mirrors, the primary mirror and this mirror, secondary mirror, are properly aligned. Okay, and for that, there's all kinds of tools that you can uh, go and make sure that the alignment is maintained all the time. I mean, not, some of them now are much easier than others to maintain, but at least you have to worry about this, this part in here when you're, uh, when you're working with it. And again, this part and this part have to be properly aligned so that when you look at an object, you can see clearly. Sometimes you have to clean this area, but you uh, have to you know, use a proper uh, cleaning uh, materials for it, and that's really something that you have to uh, to, to maintain. Again, also the alignment of this two is important too, but this one is of a more problem in terms of maintenance than this one. We have an understanding of how there's two basic difference in telescopes are. Yes. Okay. Again, uh, there are different versions of it. This, uh, the, the refractive Telescope is the one that Newton actually built. And uh, so this is the primary focus. And the cathode grain actually will, instead of going into the side, basically goes into, uh, into the, uh, an opening in between them. So again, different telescopes have different uh, technologies. I want you just to see it. Let me see if I can stop this one in here. Oops, yeah. And go into a different uh, application here. Did anybody download Tellarium? Because I don't know if last time I told you about it. Tellarium. It's a good software to have. I think Tellarium.com or Tellarium.org. Anyway, the software name is Tellarium. Okay. So here is the software. Let me, before I go there, let me first of all stop it. And let me share that with you guys. Where is more for more windows? Hmm. I have to open it in order for me to share it, but I cannot. You guys see it now or not? What do you guys look at? Okay. No, you're some, the screen right now. Yeah, yeah. I tried to get into it, but I can't for some reason. Anyway, there are some important tools in there, which are uh, I'm trying to get into, and that is basically the telescope uh, tool, which is a very important and powerful tool in uh, this one in here, and. Uh, Oh, well, I guess I can record it later on and probably post, post it on, uh, on YouTube for you guys to look at because it's a very nice tool, especially with the newer version. They have far more telescopes than the old days. Okay, so let's go back into the uh, PowerPoint. So these are the basic, basically the two 
primary ones are, the CASA grains are a little bit more expensive because they have all kinds of complicated machinery in there. And especially in terms of maintenance, they're actually a little easier to maintain than the uh, Newtonian uh, telescopes. So I guess uh, uh, sometimes it's, you can get a telescope and that's another thing actually from, uh, let me put the, this one in there for you guys, because actually if you are interested in buying one, there are some very, very nice ones that are not expensive at all. I think they are all, all within reach. So let me stop this one quickly and add the, uh, the thing in here. They're called, they're from um, uh, an organization called Astronomers Without Borders, I think like this, Astronomers Without Borders or something along this line. And their telescope is under, uh, hundred, uh, under $200, it's $199. And for $199, basically, you get a telescope, $200, basically. <laughs> you get a telescope that is a, uh, what is it, a five inch telescope or something like that. And you can have very nice images of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Jupiter and some of these planets. Actually, you can do a lot with a five inch telescope. So this is a very nice telescope. And as a, as a introductory, as the first telescope, this is actually a very nice telescope to have. Okay, so let's go back into the PowerPoint in here. Uh, professional telescopes, they can cost in the millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they are extremely a lot of work. One of the things I didn't talk about, and that is the shape of the telescope itself. In order for you to focus all the beams to a single point, you have to have parabolic antenna. That's it. You cannot work with the non-parabolic antenna. I know the antennas that you have on top of the roof of some of the houses that are parabolic antennas, the ones that are used by, by Dish Network and by the cable company, basically, at least the, before the advent now of uh, they, they are called uh, parabolic antennas, but they are not really parabolic antennas. They are cheap spherical antennas, and the sphere is cut into what looks like a parabola. In the limit, very close from the small size, the, the sphere behaves like a parabola, but it is not really. But this antenna that you're looking at in here, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, mirrors in here, they have to be made specifically exactly parabolic, number one. Number two, there will be not a single, I mean, they will be on the atomic level, basically as flat as possible, smooth as possible in that. Because you're collecting light from very far away for sensors, and you would want them to be as, uh, as real, or as Hershey said, there should not be any aberrations to them. There should not be any, defects in the image. You would want to have a, 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 a correct image of the object you're looking at, okay? That's why a lot of money is spent on this thing. Furthermore, the larger the mirror, the, because the glass actually is not, a, is not a solid, the glass is actually a liquid, okay? It starts to basically sag and change shape on you. So as you're working with larger and larger mirrors, you have to really be careful with them. You have to make them correct in a sense so that they produce the correct image. Otherwise the shape changes and you're no longer focusing on a single point. You would want to have the focus to, focus to go to a single point so that the image is sent there. You would want to collect as much light, yes, by making them as much bigger as possible, but you would want to keep the shape in that form. So this is an eight meters, eight meters in diameter telescope, so this is the uh, one of the largest ones. Uh, for some point, a long time ago, at least in the 1940s, the uh, Palomar Mountain in here, in the San California between San Diego and Los Angeles, had the largest telescope. It was a little over five meters, basically, in size. And then after that, people started making telescopes, larger and larger telescopes. So the aperture in here, that's in meters, that's at 39 meters. These telescopes in here, some of them are not operational yet, okay? So they are estimated to be ready in 2025. Hopefully this nasty thing that is going around will not delay them because we are in dire need of these things in here. If somebody has the music on,
Okay, good. Yeah, uh, I mean, probably uh, if you're receiving a phone call or something, you might need to have that. Uh, okay, anyway. So again, uh, the, this is the location of this telescope. Some of them are estimated to be operational. I'm gonna give you this file, so I'd like you to, uh, to uh, if, you want, if you have time, to go through their websites and look at them and see what wonderful images and their projects and what plan to have for them for this giant telescopes in here, 25, 25 meters all the way to 40 meters. And then you have smaller telescopes. When I say smaller, I don't mean really small, small. I mean, these are humongous telescopes, okay? They cost still hundreds of dollars uh, each, so they are not cheap telescopes. So this is the, from, uh, I mean, if you look at the dates in here, uh, when, when did we start making them? This is the 2000s, the 1990s, that's the Keck telescope. And the 1990s again, and uh, so in the, from the 90s and beyond, that's when we started to make some nice telescopes, and the bigger telescopes, the eight meters and above. From uh, the 1948 was the Mount Palomar uh, telescope, that's the Hale telescope, that's the one I was talking about earlier. And for a long time, that was the biggest telescope. And then in 1976, the Russian telescope in here, that's a six meter. And then uh, we're in Arizona in 1980, basically 1979. And then after that, the 1990s and 2000, when this newer and bigger and more powerful telescopes were put on Earth. Remember, these are in the optical, in the visible region. This is light that we normally operate with. Some of them probably operate with different frequencies, like uh, infrared, but uh, these are visible light because that's what we collect on Earth, visible light and infrared. So you cannot put a, an X-ray telescope on the ground because if you put it on the ground, uh, there is no X-ray that comes from the outside because of the atmosphere, okay? So I have to go above the atmosphere for that. So again, this is the ground-based telescope. This is super large ones. All of them, they have uh, spherical shapes, basically. They are, they are like a sphere on the outer shell, a sphere. With the exception of this one in uh, where in South Africa, that has the, uh, the that is actually made up of not really a sphere, 11 by 1 times 9.9. .9. So this is more like your your uh, ellipse that you guys worked on in the other time. So that's really an elliptical telescope. Everything else, the outer shell, of course, the the inner has to be a parabola. So uh, it's it's, it's, uh, the, the shell outside is, is a circle, but the inner one is a parabola. So if you cut it, it's going to be a parabola all the way through, okay? But this is a 3D object, of course. You can't have a parabola and call it a two-dimensional parabola. It's not going to work, okay? Just to give you a look at this telescope in here. On part A is the 5.1 meter uh, uh, a reflector telescope on uh, in uh, Mount Pal uh, Palomar. The second one is much bigger, actually. It's eight meters. But because it uses different technology on it, it's a little bit thinner, actually, a little bit thinner than the other one. It's actually uh, less bulkier. Look at the person in here, and there, this one. This is a big telescope. This is a huge machine, actually. And the primary window on it is, a uh, primary uh, mirror on it is, uh, is uh, five meters, basically. Slightly bigger than this room, or probably about this room. The other one is bigger than the living room in there. So the other one, they have eight meters. Yet, it uses less, uh, it, it's, you can see clearly that it's lighter. It's less bulkier than the other one, because the technology has advanced a lot, okay? This one requires about 14.5 ton to support the glass from underneath, okay? If we follow the same technology and make an eight meter telescope, we would require about 112 tons of steel to support it. So this will be even bigger than this one by a factor of eight, 7.72 to be more specific. But we don't do that because the technology has changed. And actually, there are computers underneath that always do corrections, basically, in point accuracy, where they go and support specific points in there. 
and keep it actually with computers, the computer aided, uh, always uh, in, in place because this is a much bigger sh shape. So the area is grown by a factor from eight uh, meter diameter all the way to five, from 5.1 all the way to eight meter. So that ratio cubed to get the volume underneath to support it, but because of the properties of steel, you have to double that quantity. So at the end, it's going to come up with a factor of 7.12. So it's 112 tons, basically, of steel underneath. So imagine this area in here grown so much. So that's why there is an explosion in terms of modern-day telescopes. And it's still very expensive to operate. It still requires a lot of basically maintenance to have them operational. And it's still a, 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 a big project in here. Again, I hope you guys have an appreciation of what's going on in here. Because it's much easier to, for somebody to say, oh, I look at this beautiful image of the temperature, look at this beautiful image of, uh, of uh, why can't we see planet? Why can't we even see uh, 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 Pluto, why do we have this fuzzy image of Pluto? Well, look at how much it goes just to make a good telescope. And even then, we don't have a good uh, image because of the fact that this thing requires a lot of work and a lot of maintenance, okay? So if somebody comes in and puts or publishes a YouTube video and starts criticizing and doing things like that and sitting from the comfort of his home and having no idea what's going on around this thing, so I really have no I think it's not fair. Okay, <laughs> that's the least we can say about it. Okay, this is uh, a new technology that you use. This is not a single mirror. Actually, the mirror, the 10 meter itself, mirror is composed of 36 uh, uh, sections. Each section is by itself, and the whole thing combines as if it's a single mirror. Again, we're trying to uh, minimize in here that, that, that stress in the glass, if you wish, for it to prevent it from. Uh, I'm tagging again that's really uh, what is required so that's why we are able to get to 10 meters and now we're getting into 40 meter re region 39 meters which is a big thing 39 meters you're looking at a half basically a uh, uh, football field this is this is a huge that's a huge telescope this is not a radio telescope this is not the the, the one that use long wavelengths where you don't have to worry about the surface and the metal can have all kinds of nonsense in it. It's still visible light, so it needs all kinds of care in it. And yet we're talking today on 39 meters. Of course, we don't have it yet, but once we have it, it's going to be a big revolution. Hopefully, we'll have even better pictures of the nearby objects. This person, Hale, was one of the people, actually, was the leading person who started working on telescopes. Um, he was known to be basically the, he, he worked on different kind of projects and one of them, and I want you guys to remember that you're supposed to be reading the chapter. There is a lot of details on the projects that he, he worked on. And uh, he built some of, some of this uh, telescope. This is the Earth telescope, which is a 40 inch telescope. Just by looking at this telescope, you can tell it's a refractor, not a reflector. That's from the length of it, okay? So I know it says in here it's a refractor telescope. And like the previous ones, which are actually a reflector, look at the surface. And here, this is actually a reflecting. And here it says reflecting. You have a mirror in here. So you can see this mirror. What is doing? It's sending the light to the secondary mirror. Do you guys see the structure, at least for the eight meter telescope? This is the primary mirror. This is the one that collects all the light. And there is a hole in here because it's sending the light to the length of it. So if you measure this distance from here to here, if you know this is eight meters, you can find what the focal length of this one is. So as this one is sent in there, then from there you're going to send it back into, this is, looks like it's a category where the light is collected and analyzed by computers. Now, modern day big telescopes, they don't have a person actually sitting behind them and looking and trying to see here and there. At least the big telescopes don't. They have all the time computer monitor, monitor devices, and usually computers pick up events and tell you what's going on. You can go as a astronomer and basically tell them what to do and move things around. But modern day telescopes, they require a lot of people working on them, and with a few astronomers actually doing the data analysis or 
directing the pro projects at the same time. So without really uh, having to know the shape, the eyepiece in the bottom in here is covered with some sort of a uh, uh, cloth in there because you don't want to collect dust because not the, the whole dome is not open actually. And uh, this, this in here also is covered. But if you open the dome and basically direct it, you need to remove this piece and you need to remove this piece and be able to see things. I don't know if you have seen pictures of uh, President, uh, which one? one of the Bush's presidents basically looking at the camera with the uh, <laughs> lens covered, okay? It's, 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 I don't mean to pick on anybody, but that's something that is on the internet all over the place, okay? So don't forget to remove the uh, the cover on the uh, on the lens itself. We're going to take a picture of anything. So, which site? And we're going to close with this uh, slide right now. Uh, which site best works for me if I'm going to put a telescope, professional telescope, spending hundreds of millions on a telescope? You don't want to go and waste it and put it somewhere where it's not going to do its job correctly. So you, you, have, you invest so much money, of course, for us in a year, I think the most expensive is almost $1,000 on a telescope. But if you're going to go and spend millions of dollars on a telescope, you really have to know where you're going to put it. So you have to choose the site correctly. The first thing that you need to make sure that you choose it in is, of course, as much clear weather as possible. You don't want the clouds, a lot of the clouds. I know Southern California does not get a lot of rain, but it's cloudy enough, so you need to find the least cloudy uh, uh, points on the planet to use your telescopes in there. Apparently, uh, Chile, and that's why if you go back a few slides in here, most of these things are uh, in places where there is not much rain, at least the newer ones. I know the California one in the old days and Russia and all of that. But look, this is Chile, this is Hawaii, Hawaii in the high mountains again, where uh, there is not uh, a lot of activity in there in terms of weather. And South Africa, Chile again, uh, Canary Islands, the uh, Canary Islands are small islands next to Africa, next to Morocco actually, but uh, they, are, uh, they used to be part of Spain. I don't know if they are on their own country or not. I think they are not a country, are they? Anybody know? Canary Islands? I think they're still part of Spain. I'm not sure. Anyway, this is Hawaii, Texas, this is a nine meter telescope. This is a big telescope in Texas, Arizona 8.4, Chile again, Hawaii, Chile, Chile and Hawaii, and Chile again. You see, if you're gonna build this thing and you're gonna spend million, uh, millions of dollars, you better put it in the right place. You don't want to waste it and put it near Los Angeles, okay? There's a problem with Los Angeles. Although it doesn't receive a lot of rain, uh, rain you will see that there are other problems with it too. I mean. You don't want as much clouds as possible because they will interfere with your telescope. And then you want it also to be as dry as possible, okay? And that's why you want it in high altitude. So even though it's, it can be a, uh, does not have a lot of clouds, it's not cloudy, but the moisture in the air will, 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 will alter or will change or will uh, uh, ruin the picture basically. And you will have, and we talked about the uh, rainbow effect the other day, the beam as it goes through, at least the visible light will be reflected in different forms, and then you will have the light that is breaking in different frequencies just because of the, of the water in the air. That's the rainbow effect. Basically. So you want it as dry as possible, that's why you go as high as possible. And then you want it to be very far away from cities. You want it to be about 100 miles from a city. So that's why the desert, desert areas are better because you don't want to have pollution from light. Light from the city will, uh, will emit a lot of radiation and that one will interfere with what you're looking at, will not give you a, a, a nice image. If you have had a chance to go to, uh, to the desert here in, uh, near Palm Springs, no, not Palm Springs, uh, 29 Palms, what is that one? Joshua Tree, at night, you will see that the night is much, much nicer than the night here in Los Angeles because of the fact that uh, uh, there is not much light in there. And the more you go, the more you go into the desert, the better it's going to look like because there is less light pollution. I was basically, uh, was astonished when I went a few years back, I think two, three, four years ago, 
to the Grand Canyon at night and we went out at night and I saw some of the most beautiful skies that I have ever seen because of the 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, there were not much light in there actually inside the Grand Canyon all the lights are turned off at night there is nothing at night night so you have to go to Williams or some other cities where you're going to see a lot of light anyway that's something that is needed for a telescope so you have to be you're going to spend a lot of money so you better put it in a place away from light pollution you don't want to remove your uh, your 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 light uh, your uh, collecting power of your telescope in there okay and then of course you avoid uh, and steady uh, and steady uh, air the air moves around it's going to alter your image and the image will be a little bit fuzzy okay and uh, this is called bed seeing so what you do in here what they do actually there is a there is a technology called the uh, use uh, uh, what is it corrective uh, uh, not corrective uh, the word escaped me right now I don't know if it's in the next slide no okay I think it's in the slide in here adaptive optics yes adaptive optics that's the word that we use <laughs> Basically, what you do, you send a laser beam. You know exactly, or would want it to point it to uh, one of the uh, stars. And because the beam is basically uh, uh, changed because of the radiation, I mean not the radiation, the uh, the air because of the motion of the air. So as it moves, the computer makes the necessary corrections in the opposite direction to keep the telescope moving opposite to which way the air is moving and give you a better picture. So if the air moves this way, the computer moves in the opposite direction to keep focus on the object you're looking at. So again, this is computer aid, and the image will become a lot better than what it would be if you're just looking at the object straight out. Here is, uh, what is it, 2.7 kilometers above the sea. So this is again Chile in here. So we are almost three kilometers above the atmosphere, about 10,000 feet basically above the uh, atmosphere about the ground and sort of the sea level and that is actually higher the higher it is the uh, the um, the less basically moisture and this is a desert so it doesn't have a lot of clouds in it and it's far away from the city and this is where the European uh, um, VLT was uh, put in there and this is about eight meters several eight meter uh, telescopes in there the point being in here uh, this is basically, you're, 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 you, you made a good investment in here. You spent a lot of money putting the telescope together. And then you put it in there for your, uh, for your uh, uh, telescope in there. So uh, there are some few old ones that are still near cities, but they're not really as good as this one in here. This is the, uh, uh, the image of uh, Mar I mean, uh, Jupiter using the eight meter tele telescope. And uh, of course, it uses these uh, adaptive optics that the one I was talking about to make the image as sharp as possible. If, if we look at it, and I tried to do it in the past when I looked at the uh, at uh, Jupiter using actually I don't remember I think it was a five a five inch telescope. So I, I didn't get that much detail. You don't get a lot of details for uh, for uh, Jupiter when you look at it this uh, with the smaller telescope. But uh, with the even with the bigger ones, it looks a lot better, of course. But uh, as it looks a lot better, you need to use better technologies. Like I said, in here, this is the adaptive uh, uh, optics in here. Okay, I'm gonna stop in here, and later on, we're gonna talk about CCD cameras because remember, part of the object is not just to collect light; is at the end is to store light, is to put it somewhere. Where you're going to be able to go and analyze it and look at it and say, okay, this is this object, this is that object. So this is part is still we're not done with it. There's a lot of talk in this chapter. We're going to finish hopefully by Thursday. Meanwhile, if you have a question related to this chapter, okay, please do ask it and let me tell you where to go again. Okay, uh, let me stop the sharing of that screen quickly. Stop. And let me share this screen with you guys. 
if you come into your uh, canvas page which is your uh, normal page that you come into and if you come to the discussion section here in the discussion section now several discussions every time i look at the uh, at the uh, uh, and Red, uh, if you guys make a comment, it will tell me up front how many comments are there. And if I have anything that I didn't read, it will tell me how many, how many I didn't read. I replied and answered all of these things. So now we have chapter six. So when you open chapter six, it tells you in here, what are we covering in here? As this video is recorded, I'm going to come later on and upload the content in here. If you find something related to this chapter, please ask questions in the reply in here. So you come in here and ask questions. So everybody gets access to the same question. You might think of something, somebody else did not think about it. And uh, once you ask it, they say, oh, maybe I should have asked. I'm glad that that person asked that question. So you will be glad that anybody asks the question in there instead of coming in here. Like I see, for example, I have two inbox messages, which is fine. If the question is not related to the lecture and it deals only specifically with you because of some scheduling issue or something that has to do with some issue you're running into related to your own thing, that's fine. You can ask the question in there. If it's a general question related to the entire topic itself, or uh, please ask us in here so that this becomes a discussion board for us in terms of this chapter. If it's uh, in general, you can always ask it in here and I can move it to its own section and becomes a general question. But the point in here, I want really a discussion to be going back and forth. I don't want this course to turn into something of a one-way street. I want it to be a um, two-way work so that we're working together. Now, at some point we have projects and we have another one that is coming soon for the um, observation of the moon. While you go outside and look at the moon, please observe the, the social distancing so that you're not close from anybody else unless you're supposed to be with them. When you do your observations and you collect your data, collect it and come back home. So uh, again, we will have a discussion in there and that's also where you're going to be uploading stuff. Let me go back into this, uh, this uh, link on your Canvas. So you come in here on Canvas, you go to every section in here, like this is the retrograde motion. This is due uh, soon. Okay. Anybody has a question, I'll be more than happy to answer it in here. And uh, if it's a general thing, we'll discuss it in here. If somebody has a question and if we want it to make into a, a more general question, we can talk about it. And probably I think we should spend next week talking about this one. When is this project due? Next Thursday. This Thursday? Next Thursday. Okay, next Thursday, good. Then I probably we should dedicate a little bit of time just for this project to talk about it in class together so that we have an understanding of what needs to be done, okay? Does everybody agree on that? Yes? I yes. think I see somebody nodding and somebody said yes, that's very good. So next uh, Thursday when we meet, We'll spend some time talking about this project to make sure we have it done right, because I really want it to be a learning experience for you more than anything else. And uh, and hopefully we continue this course. If you have any concern about the format or about the speed with which this thing is moving, and you would want to make it a general discussion, please do so. If, on the other hand, you have a question about the format, or general question about your own progress or how things are moving or things like that, and you don't want to make it public, I'll be more than happy to discuss it in the private conversations also. But please do not leave things accumulating there. I hope I know we have so many things going in our minds right now nowadays, especially with the news. I hate the news now. I honestly, I'm not be honest with you. I mean, everywhere you turn, this, 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 and it's so depressing. And I don't know. I mean, I would want to at least do something when we're together that is not related to this one. This means also that you really have to follow the news just to the extent to stay safe, to make sure that your, you yourself is safe, you and your immediate family is safe, because that's really the top uh, thing right now. Okay? Any other questions? Anything that you guys want me to talk about before we call it a day?
No? Well, thank you guys. Remember, I'm just a click away from you guys. Just go ahead and shoot. Thank you and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Let's see if everybody.